Welcome, listeners, to the Everlasting Stories Podcast. Brought to you by Sick Semper Serpent Books in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm your host, Michael Strand. On tonight's episode, I will be reading to you the second entry in The News from Crate by Nathaniel Hicklin, this episode titled The Grand Tour. In the previous installment, Wilma Dunn and her best friend, Dot Vander, traveled to the mysterious town of Crate at the suggestion of a cryptic message from Wilma's late uncle, Amos. One thing led to another. They discovered that Crate is indeed a very strange town, and they fixed a fountain. In this episode, we will indeed receive a grand tour of Crate. We're going to meet some fascinating people, go to some cool places, and uncover some more mysteries. If you enjoyed this podcast and you would like to get early access to new episodes, head over to patreon.com slash sicksemperserpent, and there for just $3 a month, you can sign up and get new episodes weeks before anyone else. Or if you just want to read all of these stories with your eyeballs, you can do so at the $1 a month level and get full access to the entire written archive. This is the news from Crate, number two, The Grand Tour by Nathaniel Hicklin. Wilma Dunn woke up in bed, her head still foggy. She felt sore in some strange places, but she couldn't really remember why. Perhaps she'd been dancing? She didn't feel hungover. She just had sore legs. And the bed felt kind of funny, too. When she got the sleep cleared out of her eyes, she took in the details of the unfamiliar bedroom, and a few things swam into focus. Right. She had spent yesterday moving into her late uncle's house in the town of Crate, taking over his job and enjoying the hospitality of the townsfolk after she fixed the fountain in the town square. It was weird. She could remember the previous morning pretty easily. The anxiety she had felt driving to Crate with her friend Dot Vander, and she could remember the feeling gradually melting away over the course of the day as the town welcomed her into its embrace. Right. She remembered Dot had come with her, and that she was at the party last night, or the dance, or whatever. Wilma left the bedroom in her jammies and checked the other bedrooms looking for Dot. She found some of Dot's stuff in one of the spare rooms, but the bed hadn't been used. Wilma wasn't really that surprised. Dot was an expert at making best friends at a moment's notice, She had probably met someone within ten minutes of the party and ended up crashing with them for the night. With that minor set of mysteries resolved, Wilma showered and dressed for the day, looking through the clothes she had packed for something sensible but fun. She picked out a t-shirt with one of the less sarcastic slogans and a pair of unadorned capri pants, completing the outfit with her uncle's tool belt. The belt was well suited to the purpose of carrying the weight of the tool comfortably, but it was difficult to pick an outfit that made it look like it belonged there. Perhaps there was some place in town where she could get something to tie the look together. As she headed downstairs to look through the kitchen for anything that might suffice as breakfast, the ticker tape box on the wall started binging again, and another little ribbon of paper came ticking out. Wilma hefted the tool and strode over to the box to see what job might be waiting for her this time, but all it said was, Wilma Dunn. Council meeting, town hall, ten hundred hours. Wilma put the tool back in its holster and checked her phone for the time, a little put out that she wasn't going to get to be the hero of the day again so soon. She had almost an hour until ten, so she headed out in search of something to fill her belly. She saw a handful of people on the way towards the main street, and all of them gave her a friendly wave and a greeting, and she greeted them all back. It was surreal 
She never lived anywhere where the people seemed so ungrudgingly friendly and open. She'd made friendly with co-workers before, of course, but only ever a few of them after working at a place for a few weeks to figure out who was cool and who wasn't. She'd been in Crete for less than a day, and she already felt like everyone in town was genuinely friendly and had something interesting to say. She wouldn't have minded spending 15 minutes getting to know any one of them. A few blocks down her street, she finally saw the rows of houses and lawns give way to a clutch of shops clustered together around a single, glistening yellow traffic light. She couldn't entirely tell what sorts of things they sold. They simply looked homey and quaint. She peeked in through one or two of the windows, and what came to mind was more like a craft fair, or maybe the vendor hall of some kind of weird convention. None of these places had a tray full of generic cheap gadgets by the counter that had nothing to do with the rest of the shop. There wasn't a single cluster of standard-issue wire racks or metal hooks slotted into a slat wall. Nothing about these shops gave Wilma the idea that their owners had ordered their fittings from a catalog. The hardware that displayed the merchandise looked just as homemade, distinctive, and fitting into the ethos of the town as the merchandise itself. As for the merchandise, Wilma couldn't find a single shop that sold more than five different things. Everyone here seemed to have found their own little microscopic, needle-focused niche in the local economy, and they had carved it open and made a home there. The first shop only made glass bottles in various shapes and colors. Another one only made belt holsters, and other strap-based accessories. Wilma looked down at the holster that held her tool, and it hid the same label as the rest of the stuff in there. At first, she didn't see anywhere that sold anything that seemed breakfasty. But even if there had been a little boutique muffin shop on the street, Wilma probably would have passed it up for something with a little more variety. The street of shops led to a large roundabout, with a giant clock tower at the center, showing the time to all four points of the compass. Behind the clock stretched the rest of the town square, where more people were milling around. A few cars drove back and forth along the other main streets, presumably on their way to some place of work or other, although Wilma couldn't imagine anyone living more than half an hour's walk from their work in Crate. Maybe there were farms on the outskirts or something. Or maybe there were actually people who worked in other towns. She put it on the list of things to bring up at the meeting. But first, she had to investigate the smell of bacon coming from her left. The sumptuous scent turned out to be emanating from a cafe full of other people with the same idea as her. The front door even had a little jingly bell, like all the finest cafes, and everyone gave her a friendly wave when they saw her walk in. She walked up to the counter and greeted the guy in the standard cafe-issue apron and paper hat standing behind it. He looked familiar from the big to-do last night, but she didn't recall hearing his name. "'Morning, Wilma,' he said. His apron had something embroidered on it that looked like Russian or something, but he sounded just like everyone else. "'What can I get you?' "'I smell bacon,' she said. "'I think I need some.' "'Bacon? You got it,' said the guy in the hat." Anything else? Well, what else you got? <laughs> you name it, I got it. How about two Belgian waffles and some scrambled eggs? Sure thing. What topping on the waffles? Maple syrup and butter? Coming right up. Go ahead and take a seat. He pushed open a swinging door and left the counter, and Wilma found an empty table. There was some idle chatter among the other patrons. Each had a plate of different food in front of them. She couldn't identify a couple of the dishes, but before she could take a closer look, there was a ding from the counter. Order up for Wilma, said the guy in the hat. Belgian waffles, maple syrup and butter, scrambled eggs, and some fine, fine bacon. It hadn't even seemed like enough time to make a waffle, but there they were, steaming and delicious. He turned a key, or something, on the back of a tin box on the counter, and a number spun into place in a window in front of it just above a little hatch that said insert. Wilma put coins into the hatch that added up to the total and the number spun again to display the change. There was a clatter of metal and another hatch popped open near the bottom of the box with her change inside. And there we go, said the guy in the hat. Enjoy your breakfast. Thanks, said Wilma. 
She took her food to the table and dug in. Even if it was prepared suspiciously quickly and was maybe weird fake food for all she knew, it was still a mighty good breakfast. She saw everyone else leaving their dishes on the table as they left, so she did the same as she finished the last of her eggs and headed back out into the square. The city hall was standing right there. She had about 15 minutes before the meeting, but it wouldn't hurt to be early the first time. She walked across the square as the cool dew of dawn began to cook off the pavement and headed into City Hall. When she entered the building, she saw the town lawyer, Latimer Ferneco, sitting on a bench in the lobby. Oh, good morning, Latimer, said Wilma. I heard there was a meeting this morning. Yeah, I heard that too, said Latimer, holding his smartphone and waving its screen at her. Oh, you get the messages on your phone, said Wilma. I've got this paper tape thing in my house. Yeah, yeah, well, you do, right. Uh, I forgot to mention yesterday, said Latimer. Do you have a smartphone? I do. I don't have any bars, though. You need to get the phone tied to the town Wi-Fi. It's way faster than the old paper printers, and it'll be easier for you when you've got a job to do. Head over to the library. It's across the way after the meeting, and they'll set you up. Sounds good, said Wilma. Where's the meeting, by the way? Oh, right here, said Latimer, pointing a thumb at the door next to him. I was just waiting for more people to show up. The benches out here are much more comfortable than the chairs in there. Um, I guess that makes sense, said Wilma. I think I'll join you. Wilma took a seat at one of the other benches, and the other members of the council filtered in. She recognized Dr. Nance in her sweet leather jacket, and Wolfgang Turn in his mechanic's overalls. But the others were strangers to her. Latimer introduced them to Wilma, and she shook hands all around. She was definitely the youngest of all of them, but only a few were what she would call old. In terms of overall appearance and dress, they were a pretty varied bunch. In the meeting room, each council member had a seat with the nameplate around the big table. They all took their seats. A slot in one wall started making printer noises and spitting out pages into a tray. And a woman with a floppy hat, pinstripe fitted smock with pockets full of surveyor tools, and little flecks of paint on her face went over to collect the stack. She took a look at the first page, squared the stack, and laid it on the table in front of Wilma. Hmm. Are we back to using printouts? said a gruff-looking, dark-haired guy with a scar on his face and a suit of hard plastic armor that made him look like a post-apocalyptic stunt biker. He also had a falcon on his shoulder. She isn't on the town Wi-Fi yet, said Latimer. I already told her. Yeah, said Wilma. I'm going to visit the library after the meeting. <laughs> Good, said the scarred guy. His nameplate read Augustus Dorschmeyer. You can never tell with some people. We don't want to have you missing a call. He gave her a sneer as he said this, and his voice was a low rasp, as though he were trying to sound scary. But no one else said anything about it. Maybe he just sounded like that all the time, like he had picked a voice to go with the outfit. The rest of the council members pulled out their phones, and the lady with paint on her called the meeting to order. Compared to the town as a whole, the meeting felt surprisingly normal, a lot of it was not anything that Wilma directly needed to know about, but they got sidetracked by conversations and personal catching up several times, and the most spirited discussion was about what day was best for someone's upcoming house party. There was an official introduction for Wilma as the new council member, but most of the meeting was about what jobs people had done recently, including Wilma's work on the fountain, and anything that wasn't immediately clear to Wilma was laid out in the printout. Before Wilma knew it, the meeting was over, and everyone got up from their chairs and started casually socializing as they strolled out into the square. Wilma exchanged a few words with some of them before breaking away to go to the library. As Latimer had said, the library was indeed across the way just on the other side of the town square, next to the clock tower. In some ways, it seemed more prestigious a building than the town hall itself, with a fancy dome 
and a facade that made it look like a university building. The inside had the usual information desk in the middle and shelves around it, but Wilma didn't see anyone she could ask about the Wi-Fi. To her right was a door with the words game room on it, and there was someone bustling around behind it. And then the door opened. Wilma got a glimpse of tables with boxes piled on them, boards with figures laid out, and walls covered with hundreds and hundreds of keys on individual hooks. And then someone came through. The young woman wore a dark-colored crop top, canvas cargo pants, and lace-up thigh-high boots with lots of stainless steel hardware. Her outfit was framed by a kind of knit robe, piped and braided with steel cable, which matched her dark hair, which was bound up in lots of thin braids and tied behind her head. Each braid had some kind of wire or tinsel woven into it and was wrapped at the tip with more wire. She was maybe five feet tall, even with the boots, and she had a bright, friendly glint in her eyes. Hi, she said. I haven't seen you around before, have I? You seem like you might be familiar. I just got in yesterday, said Wilma. She extended a hand. Wilma Dunn. Imogen Billet, she said. Great to meet you. Wilma suddenly realized that she had noticed all of these details about Imogen the moment the door of the game room had opened. Some part of her recognized that she didn't usually take in people that quickly. She wondered what it might mean. But it might have something to do with the fact that Imogen filled out her clothes very well and that she had soft hands and beautiful eyes. Wilma realized that she was probably maintaining the handshake a little longer than she probably should. Uh, yeah, so they said that you could get my phone on the Wi-Fi, said Wilma. Yep, sure can, said Imogen. Right over here. Imogen stepped behind the info desk and held out her hand for Wilma's phone. Wilma brushed her fingers against one of Imogen's just for a moment as she handed it over, just to see if Imogen did anything but she didn't seem to notice. Oh, you've got one of these old ones, said Imogen. Haven't seen one of these in a while. Wilma thought that this was a pretty weird thing to say since she had used part of Uncle Amos's bequest to buy it. It had been the newest model in the store at the time and she had only gotten it a few weeks ago. Now she wanted to see what kind of phones everyone else had that made the current generation look old-fashioned. Imogen reached down behind the desk and flipped a loud switch, causing a section of the desk surface to lift up about two feet to reveal a burnished aluminum box beneath it. She twisted a control on her side of the box, and a wire drawer slid open, into which she placed Wilma's phone. She twisted the control again, and the drawer slid closed. Hey, you want to press the button? said Imogen. It's just around this side. You can see it if you lean over the counter. Am I allowed to do that? said Wilma. I mean, I don't want to do anyone's job for them. Well, it's my job, so I guess I'm allowed to delegate if I decide to, said Imogen. If I want to let someone else push my button, should that be up to me? Wilma thought she saw Imogen give a little wink, but it might have been her imagination. The tiny smile and the warm feelings she got from it certainly wasn't. She leaned over the top of the counter to look at the back of the box, She saw the selector knob with little pictures around it. She saw a couple of buttons. It honestly looked more like the controls of an old washing machine than anything to do with Wi-Fi. So which of these buttons do you want me to push? She said. The middle one here, said Imogen, tapping next to the third button in a column of five. Wilma pressed the button with a little click, which took more effort than she was expecting and a blue light came from the wire drawer for a few seconds. After it was done, the drawer slid open, and Wilma took her phone back, still apparently in one piece. She woke up the phone, but still had no cell signal. Is there something I have to enable? said Wilma. I still haven't got any bars. Oh, you should have a new icon on there, said Imogen, leaning on the counter like a friendly neighborhood bartender. Give that a tap. And sure enough, the phone screen had an icon with a generic-looking combination of shapes. She tapped it with her thumb, and the screen instantly transitioned to a feed of council messages. In the corner, 
was a little performance readout, the signal strength was at 100%, and the connection speed was more than 2 gigabits per second. Whoa, said Wilma. That's some fast Wi-Fi you've got there. Yeah, Crate can be like that sometimes, said Imogen. Actually, I think I might have seen you out and about yesterday. Do you have any relation to Amos Dunn? Um, yeah, he was my uncle. He left me his job to do. Right, that was you at the fountain, wasn't it? I thought I might have seen you before. So, you just got here yesterday, huh? Yep, said Wilma. Still trying to get my bearings. I've almost gotten used to the money and the decor, but I'm still finding new things, weird things, all the time. Well, it sure seems like you're getting a good start, said Imogen. I'll tell you what, it doesn't feel like a busy day around here, and I'll get alerts if anything comes up. How about I give you the grand tour? I mean, I couldn't show you absolutely everything of interest, but I can definitely point out the stuff that you ought to know about. Sure, I'd love a tour, said Wilma. Right now, I'd appreciate any help I can get. Lead the way. Awesome, said Imogen. She retracted the aluminum box into the counter and headed for the door. First things first, though, have you been to Ben's cafe yet? Mm, I'm not sure about any Ben, said Wilma, as she followed Imogen out into the square, but I had breakfast in a cafe this morning. Did the guy at the counter have a little paper hat and an apron with something like Russian on it? Yep, that was him. Well, that's Ben. That's what he calls himself anyway. His real name is Longer and in Croatian or something, but he just goes by Ben. What'd you have? Waffles, bacon, scrambled eggs? Imogen stopped on the sidewalk. That's it? Oh, sweetie, we definitely have to go stop at the cafe. They got to the cafe in time for the start of lunch. People were waiting in line to give their orders to Ben, and more of them were loitering at the end of the counter to pick up their plates. There was even more variety among the dishes than there had been at breakfast. When they reached the counter, Imogen ordered a lamb and lentil stew with rhubarb puree, and Ben took the order without a blink. He didn't seem to think her order any more or less weird than waffles and bacon. Imogen then turned to Wilma and gave her a look that said, Try to impress me. Order anything. So Wilma ordered goat cheese stuffed ravioli with white wine sauce and toasted chanterelles. Ben just said it would be right up, and a minute later he had two plates for them. They put in their money and took the food to a table, and it was some of the best ravioli Wilma had ever eaten. So, she said between bites, this Ben is quite the stock of ingredients in the back, huh? I don't know, said Imogen. I think it's either simpler or more complicated than that. All I know is that Ben can fill any order you can think of. I assume he's got some kind of nutrient synthesis thing back there or something. I do know that you'll get the same blend of vitamins and stuff no matter what you order. So whatever he gives you will just be good for you. There's no bad food here. Huh. Well, that explains how everyone in town seems to be in such good shape, said Wilma. Well, that and there are a lot of runners here, said Imogen. The race they do every year is one of the most popular social events in town. What race, said Wilma. Oh, it's part of the street fair every summer, said Imogen. I don't want to spoil it for you. It's soon, and it's great. You'll love it. Anyway, she said as she dug into her stew, come on, I don't want to rush you through your ravioli, but don't dawdle too much. We've got a lot more stuff to see. After a peaceful but hasty ravioli lunch, Wilma left her dishes on the table and followed Imogen down a side street to a low squat building with a sign on the front lawn that said, Sheriff's Office. Going to meet the local law, huh? Wilma asked. Well, I mean, I can introduce you to a couple of the deputies, said Imogen, but there's something else here that you really need to see. She opened the front door of the building to reveal a skinny young man sitting at a desk doing a crossword puzzle. Ah, oh, good morning, Imogen, said the deputy. What's up? 
Hi, said Imogen. Wilma here is new in town, so I wanted to show her the window. Also, it's afternoon there, buddy. Mm. Whoa, is it? said the deputy. He didn't seem like the kind of person who got called on to perform critical thinking duties too often. Fair enough, then. And he went back to his crossword. Wilma stole a glance at it as they passed, and he had maybe filled in two words. Imogen led them down a hallway and into a room with a desk against one wall. The wall itself was covered with a large framed mirror, and there was a microphone elaborately housed in aluminum at the center of the desk, positioned at mouth height for anyone sitting in the chair. To one side of the mirror was a knob, half surrounded by numbers. You know how jails have those long rooms with glass and phones for people to talk to the prisoners? said Imogen. Yeah, said Wilma. Am I here to talk to a prisoner? Nah, there's no one like that here now, said Imogen. At least, not unless someone got real rowdy last night that I didn't hear about. Besides, we need to arrange with a deputy to talk to a prisoner, even if they had one. No, you're here to talk to someone else. Imogen sat down in a spare chair at the side of the room. Wilma waited a few seconds before realizing that she had some work to do in this conversation. Um, and? Who am I supposed to talk to? I don't know. We'll find out together, said Imogen. She looked thoughtful for a moment. Have you ever used one of those old antenna-style TVs? You know, with the turning knob? Yeah. Well, it's kind of like that, she nodded toward the knob. Wilma took a seat at the microphone and turned the knob to the top number. The mirror changed into a view of a cheap curtain with the faint hint of bars visible through the thin gap in the middle. She then twisted the knob to a random distance past the top number and the image changed to a black void. Even though there was no color or shape in the glass, she could still somehow discern swirls and spirals in the mist of the blackness until an image finally faded into view. It appeared to be a mirror image of the room she was sitting in, but run through a filter that made everything look just a little fancier. The desk was made of some exotic, intricately carved wood, and the microphone was a slender stalk with a small black bulb at the end instead of the sturdy silver protrusion that Wilma had. The wall at the back of the room was draped in velvet, instead of the law enforcement issue beige and taupe paint. The woman sitting opposite Wilma had her hair done up on the top of her head with care and precision. She wore a glamorous red dress and gleaming platinum bracelets. One hand held a glass of red wine and had a ring of stitching all around the wrist. Other than those differences, though, it was like looking into a mirror. Between the hairline and the neckline, she looked exactly like Wilma. Greetings, she said. It's always a pleasure to meet a kindred spirit, I'm sure. Likewise, said Wilma. She tried to sound confident and certain in the face of this unexpected development, but the woman behind the glass gave a satisfied chuckle, like she could see right through it. I suspect you've started only recently then, she said, taking a sip of wine. At least Wilma thought it looked like wine. Um, yeah, somewhat recently said Wilma. Uh, but I learned fast. Mm, that's good, said the woman. She raised a knee and crossed it. You will find that learning fast will come in handy for you. She raised another knee and crossed it in the other direction. Wilma's brow furrowed. She tried to recover without showing her confusion. So you have a job too then? Of course, she said, leaning back in her chair. It was much nicer than the cheap metal thing Wilma was sitting in, and it was made from some kind of metallic plastic that she couldn't identify. We all have our jobs to do, don't we? She finished her glass and extended it to the side, in the direction that mirrored where Imogen was sitting, and an unseen companion refilled it with what Wilma assumed to be the same fluid as before, though it looked a little more brown this time. By the way, said the woman as she swirled her wine glass, I believe your friend needs some help. 
Huh? Wilma looked over at Imogen, who seemed just as she had been when they entered. When Wilma turned back to the glass, it had gone dark. Hello? The darkness swirled, and then it changed back to its original mirror finish. Yeah, that's usually how it works, said Imogen. How what works, said Wilma. What was that? Best we can figure, said Imogen. It shows you one of several alternate versions of yourself. We don't know quite why, but they're usually at least a little helpful. I don't know, said Wilma. She seemed pretty cryptic. Also, I think she had three legs. Oh, really? Cool. Mine had a sweet pair of swords on her back, and a lot of her skin was replaced with steel plates. She stood up and headed out of the room, and then Wilma rushed to follow her. Wait, wait, said Wilma. That's it? Was that all we came here for? All? Does that kind of thing happen a lot where you're from? Well, I mean, I would think that this kind of thing is something you'd spend more than five minutes on. Oh, well, I can go into it more later, and you can do it again if you want. They'll pretty much let people come in to use the window as they please. They walk back into the front room, where the seated deputy gave them the same friendly wave. He seemed to have filled out two or three more words in his puzzle. How'd it go? he asked. Oh, just fine, buddy, said Imogen. We're going to... But Imogen's knees started to give way and she just managed to catch herself before she collapsed completely. Whoa, she said. She raised a hand to her head. Are you okay? asked Wilma. That was weird, said Imogen. What? Oh, come on. She pulled her phone out of a pocket and checked something on it. Oh, I've been an idiot. She started to collapse again, but Wilma moved forward and got her arms around Imogen's torso, She felt Imogen's phone starting to slip, and she reached behind her to catch it before it fell. What's the matter? asked Wilma. Doctor. Hey, deputy, said Wilma. Call 911 right now. Imogen began weakly to shake her head. Oh, does she need a doctor? said the deputy. Imogen started whispering something. What is it? said Wilma. Take me. Doctor. Alrighty, folks, that's it. That's tonight's story. We had a little bit of a cliffhanger for you, but don't worry. Next week, we will be back with the news from Crate, part three, a good fit, which directly continues this story. Once again, you heard The Grand Tour by Nathaniel Hicklin. If you liked this podcast, you can sign up at patreon.com slash sickseperserpent at the $3 a month level to get new episodes weeks before anyone else. And if you're a weirdo who likes to read things with their eyeballs, you can get instant access to the entire archive of short stories for just a dollar a month. The text and audio for tonight's podcast were produced by me, Michael Strand, managing editor at Six Semper Serpent. Tonight's story was authored by Nathaniel Hicklin, Six Semper Serpent writer, and tonight's podcast was published by T. Martin Krauss, editor in chief at Six Semper Serpent Books. If you like the music tonight, you can find more from the producer Lackey Inspired. Head on over to soundcloud.com slash Lackey Inspired and check out his work. It is fantastic. And finally, I want to say thank you to each and every one of our Patreon subscribers, as well as our listeners. Thanks for subscribing, 
Thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or wherever. Chances are they'll love it too. All right, listeners, I'll see you next time on the Everlasting Stories podcast. Thank you.